Uh, so my name is Aaron Hilliard. I'm the vice president of KPMS and uh, program director. And last uh, November, I got the honor of meeting Alan uh, when he was up here in the Pacific Northwest. And we went and foraged mushrooms and made some videos for my channel and whatnot. And uh, we've kind of corresponded back and forth. And I asked him to come do a presentation here at, on one of his many fortes in mushroom expertise. And uh, so he's uh, the chief mycologist for Mimosa Therapeutics, I believe. And, uh, and he uh, does a lot in the, in the realm of DNA sequencing and figuring out uh, taxonomy on mushrooms and also photography. And so today he's here to give us a talk uh, about photography and uh, I'm sure a bunch of interesting mushroom stuff. So uh, I'm just honored to uh, introduce Alan Rockefeller to KPMS. So take it away, Alan. All right, thanks, Aaron. All right, so I learned, I started photographing mushrooms about 20 years ago, and I learned absolutely the wrong way. And the way I learned to take pictures of mushrooms is I took really bad pictures of mushrooms for about 10 years. Um, later, looking back, I realized that if I had just asked somebody who, who knew how to take pictures of mushrooms, uh, how to do it right, I could have learned everything I learned in 10 years in an hour. So what I'm gonna to try to do uh, in this talk is uh, teach you everything you need to know to take good pictures of mushrooms uh, so you don't have to spend years and years taking bad mushroom pictures like I did. <laughs> um, I, I'll take questions at the end. So if you have any questions, you can just type them into the chat and we'll scroll back through the chat and, uh, and answer them. So uh, the best camera to use for mushrooms is the one you have with you. So a cell phone is a really good camera for mushrooms in some ways. We'll talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of cell phones. Uh, but you know the cell phone cameras have gotten much better over the years. So especially for large mushrooms, um, they, they really do a pretty good job. And uh, the reason they do so, uh, so well is because they're small, lightweight, fast, and easy. And then with a fancy camera, you go home and process all of the pictures so they look as good. Um, they look on the, on the screen like they did in the field, whereas cell phones do all that processing instantly in the, in the phone camera. So they save a whole lot of time. Um, and then to get a good picture with the camera, you usually need a tripod. Um, whereas with the cell phone, you just hold it up there and uh, I always take all my photos when I'm using a cell phone with the iNaturalist app. And that way, as soon as you get cell phone service, or so right away if you have that in the woods, then your uh, photos get uploaded to iNaturalist. You don't have to upload everything at the end of the day. And uh, you know, it's, already, it's super easy to share the pictures. However, the worst thing about cell phones is they don't work very well for tiny mushrooms. And sometimes the focus is, a, is not focused on what you want. And then with a nice camera, the background can look really good. And the background on a cell phone camera, cell phone photo usually does not look very good. Um, and then the images aren't quite as sharp overall. Um, and a really cool thing you can do with a fancy camera is set the depth of field. So that controls how much of the frame is in focus and the cell phones don't have an adjustable aperture, so there's no way to do that on a phone. So here is a Matsutake, and here's a picture I took of the Matsutake with a cell phone, and here's a picture I took uh, with a fancy camera. And if you look, you can see there's a lot more detail um, on these, uh, the camera photo. Also, this is the cell phone one. So if you look at the stem, it's kind of like white, the highlights are blown out and there's just no detail on the bright parts. Whereas with this one, um, there's, there's detail everywhere. There's more depth of field and the background looks nicer. Um, but you also notice that just flipping between them, you can't tell the difference very easily. You know, they both look fine on a web page. Um, it's really not until you zoom in all the way um, that you actually see a lot of difference. So cell phones in general are pretty good. So when you're taking pictures with the cell phone, where you hold it makes a huge difference in how your photos come out. So usually when I find, uh, when I find mushrooms, I'll set them up and I'll set them up not 
just like to have the camera anywhere, but I'll set them up with an idea in mind of where I'm going to be holding the camera, whether it's a phone or a fancy camera. Um, you know, I, I, they generally are, are made to be taken from one perspective and that perspective is never like from up above. So you never just wanna shoot down on top of the mushroom. Uh, it's usually closer to the ground is where your photos look good. Um, and, you know, cool thing about cell phones, the cameras are so tiny, you can put the camera right on the ground and uh, that can look really cool. And then if you use selfie mode, you can stick the phone under the mushroom and take the picture coming back up, but it only works with really big mushrooms because the minimum focusing distance um, is usually about a foot. Um, and there's not a lot of controls on a cell phone, but there is one super important control that you very often can use to get a better photo, and that's the exposure compensation. So all exposure compensation does is tells the camera how much light together, so it's the brightness of the photo. So if you have a white mushroom and most of the scene is dark, the camera will meter the light on the dark background, and then that white subject will be completely blown out. And what that means is that it's too bright and you lose all of the detail. So if you lower the exposure compensation, then all of a sudden, uh, then the background gets really dark, which is fine. But the mushroom, all those details that would normally be blown out if you just press the shutter, all those details come back. So. One way to do that is to uh, hold your phone up there and press on the mushroom and then that lets the phone know that the subject is right there. Uh, sometimes that works, sometimes not. So a more reliable thing to do is raise and lower the exposure compensation. And there's ways to do that on iPhones and Android. Um, it's not too difficult, but you just raise and lower that brightness until the mushroom looks the best and that will improve your cell phone photos drastically. So uh, cell phones don't work very well with tiny mushrooms, but there's a couple of things you can do to make them work as well as possible. And the first thing is that your phone should be focused as close as it possibly can. So I move the phone so close that it's blurry and then just back it off until it gets crisp. And then once I have it focused as close as I can, then I use digital zoom to fill the screen. And uh, in that way you get the, the most resolution. There are some magnifying lenses for cell phones. Uh, I haven't had very good luck with them, but some people do. Here's one picture I took of a tiny mushroom with a cell phone. So that's about, about the best I can do with, with a cell phone. You can see it's definitely not bad. So one of the most important things if you're going to get a good mushroom photo is choosing which mushroom to photograph. Um, if you just walk through the woods and take a picture of every mushroom, you'll end up with a whole lot of very mediocre mushroom photos. And so if you find something that's super rare, you really wanna document that it occurs there and there's only one of them, then go ahead and photograph it. But generally you wanna hold out and not take pictures of mushrooms until you see that there's a bunch of different, uh, a bunch of specimens of the same species in an area. And then you say, okay, this is worth photographing. So um, a lot of times the, some of the important uh, parts of the mushroom are, uh, are underground. So like with an amanita, you wanna pop out the stem base with a knife from below on at least one of them, because otherwise uh, there'll be important things that you can't see in your photos. And it's really important to set the mushrooms up. And so, um, you know, nature does not set up the mushrooms for you. They're just kind of scattered around. And that's okay, but it's extremely rare that you'll have like a, a really good natural setup. You know, just like some, you know, one time in a thousand, there'll be like three mushrooms in a row and it'll just look spectacular without doing anything. But usually uh, what I'll do is find a patch of mushrooms and I'll look for the biggest group of the biggest nice group of mushrooms that's naturally there and then I'll pick a few other mushrooms that would have been out of the frame and set them down next to that natural group of mushrooms and that way you can see all of the different features of the mushroom in one photo and, um, and it looks as good as it possibly can. Um, you can see in this one I included the stem base so the mushrooms never look good 
uh, when you cut the stem bases off, unless it's in your kitchen or something. And you know, all cameras do is capture the light that's there. So lighting is super important. And about one third of the time, the natural light is perfect and spectacular and there's nothing you can do to make that any better. But about two thirds of the time, uh, adding a little bit of light will make the picture better. So the way I usually try to do it is have about 90% of the light come from natural light and 10% from artificial light because artificial light never looks as good as natural light. There's nothing you can do. Um, so, but um, just filling in those shadows a little bit um, will make almost any natural light photo a little bit better. So just a, a tiny bit of artificial light, not, a, not so much that it looks uh, artificially lit, will give you the best picture. And you'll notice if you try to buy a really expensive camera, it won't have a flash on the top. And that's because the flash that's on the camera always kind of ruins a photo. So they just don't let you do that when you spend $5,000 for a camera. Um, so you generally want to not avoid using that flash that's uh, right on top of the camera. Um, same with the cell phone. However, you know, if there's not enough light there, you know, some, the, the light from the flash is way better than no light. So try it both ways. But if they, made uh, if they made cameras for mushroom photographers, they would have put the flash under the lens because uh, that way the light comes up and illuminates the gills. So if you hold the camera upside down or just on its side, then the flash is not above the lens and you don't cast that harsh shadow on the most important part of the mushroom. And here's what I'm talking about when I mean that harsh shadow. And uh, this one, um, another thing you want to pay attention to is the light in the background. So this would not have been a terrible picture if I didn't have such a bright background. So a lot of times what I'll do now is carry a piece of black felt and set it behind the mushroom. Um, and that would have made this look pretty cool. And so here's what I did with the black felt. And when I first took this picture, it didn't look very good because there was a really bright field behind me. And so I just took that black felt out of my backpack I uh, got it for like five bucks on eBay and hung it in the tree behind the mushroom. And then uh, it turned the terrible mushroom photo into a pretty good mushroom photo. Um, this one also, you can see I put a, a lot of light. There's lights to the right and to the left uh, and behind this mushroom. So it's basically surrounded by lights and it does not look natural, but I wasn't really going for natural and it ended up working pretty well. Here's one uh, with the black felt. And you can see there's just a tiny bit of, uh, of lint on the felt. You can take that out with Photoshop if it bothers you, but it doesn't really matter very much. What mushroom is that? Uh, this one is Psilocybe aztecorum. Oh, okay. So Psilocybe aztecorum uh, grows at the, it was discovered at the high elevation, uh, right on top of the volcanoes uh, in, in central Mexico. Um, and then recently it's turned up in Colorado and Arizona at medium elevation, and then in Canada, it grows at sea level. Wow, not a lot of blueing there. No, no those don't blue very much. Um, so these days when I go out, I always carry a few of these LED lights, and I like them a lot, a uh, lot more than flash for a few different reasons. Uh, I don't even carry flashes anymore. Um, and a lot of times, you know, that, that little flashlight on your cell phone is actually a pretty good light. So a lot of times I'll pull out my phone and use that uh, for additional light. But there's some other lights where the has the light coming from more directions. Um, so these are the three lights that I carry with me everywhere. Uh, the best one is that tube light on top because uh, it's like 15 centimeters long or so. So it, uh, the light comes from all of those different directions and it doesn't cast a harsh shadow. Um, so that, that's really nice. Um, but often I'll set up like all three lights, but I'll turn them way, way down. So most of the light is natural light. And then I have each light on at like 1%. So it's just filling in a little bit. And, uh, these are all the Ulanzi brand, which works pretty well. They charge with USB-C and they have these internal rechargeable batteries and you can, uh, adjust the color. So any color you want and, and any brightness. Now, so here I am using them. You see there's a lot of natural light here and then just a little bit of extra light uh, coming in from these LED lights. 
And in this picture, you can see that I'm holding my phone and the, the light's on on the phone. So I was using uh, my, flash, uh, my flashlight on the cell phone. Uh, if you look up at the mushrooms there, you can see there's pretty harsh shadow on the gills there. And so what I did is I did like a three second exposure. And then while the uh, shutter was open, I moved the light in an arc under the lens. And that way uh, there was no harsh shadow coming from my light. And there was like a nice, even little bit of extra light, just, just bright enough to, to illuminate the gills. So you can get better photos out of an expensive camera that you can out of a cell phone, but there's a lot of disadvantages too. So for a lot of people, a cell phone is a better choice. Um, if you buy a, a fancy camera, you, know, you should expect your photos to be worse for about a year than they were when you started using a cell phone. Um, and then after a year or so of practice, you'll, you'll be able to get much better photos out of a camera. Uh, but it's not nearly as easy. There's so many settings and you have to set up a tripod, you know, think about different lenses and the post-processing. Um, you know, so the cell phones do all the post-processing inside there and try to get the color balance and all these different things right. And sometimes they do a good job and sometimes not, but they do it instantly. And so uh, when you take a picture with the camera, the photographer's job is only half done. The other half of the job is to go home and make that photo look like it actually looked out in the field. So uh, that's a, a lot of work and it's worth it if you really care how your photos look. Uh, but if you're not the kind of person that wants to go home from the forest every day and spend a couple hours on the computer, then it's not worth it. But if you carry a fancy camera, you can get much higher resolution than a cell phone. So that means you can crop more, um, and uh, you, know, you can print out you know, even something you know, really large size. And um, you can also switch lenses. So ma macro lenses are really, uh, really good for getting tiny details. And so you can put a macro lens on. I actually only carry a macro lens these days because um, macro lenses work fine for farther away as well. Um, another really good thing with a, with a fancy camera is that you can take a tri um, you, you pretty much always want to use a tripod, but you can keep taking the same picture until it turns out how you like it. So usually I'll take a picture and look at my picture and then I'll be like, oh, there's a blade of grass in front of the mushroom. I don't like that shadow there or there's some, some other thing that I can fix. And so I'll take the picture four or five times. And when I'm finally done, then I'm like, okay, this is good. There's nothing nothing more that can be done in the field to make this better. Um, but to really make a, a stunning photo, focus stacking is a really important technique that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, one of the main advantages of the camera is that you can set the depth of field. So with a cell phone, the depth of field is the depth of field. The aperture is not adjustable, but with a camera, it ha has an aperture inside the lens and that aperture determines how much light enters the camera. And that also determines the depth of field. So if you open that aperture up all the way, lots of light comes in, you can use a fast shutter speed, but the depth of field is very narrow. So usually if you got a bunch of mushrooms, not all of them will be in focus. And, um, and so you can close that aperture down and then more things will be in focus, things that are both close and further away. So if you close the aperture down a whole lot, so that's a higher F number, then you get a ton of depth of field. So all the mushrooms are in focus, but the problem is then the background is in focus too. And so the mushrooms don't stand out from the background very much. So uh, often it's best to shoot at the most open aperture. So it's the lowest F number that you can get away with and still have your whole subject in focus. Uh, here's a picture I took with the aperture open all the way. So you can see that the mushrooms, the, the very part of the mushroom that's closest to me is nice and crisp, but the rest of it is not in focus. Uh, sometimes that's great and it looks good. And then sometimes, you know, you're like, oh man, most of what I wanted to get in this frame is just blurry. What's that mushroom? A parrot? Uh, this is uh, the Gleophorus citocinus, so parrot mushroom. Oh, okay. Pretty. 
Um, this one here is a photo I took with the aperture closed down most of the way. So that's, this was a F22. So you can see that the part of the mushroom that's really close to me is in crisp focus. And then the part of the mushroom that's far is in crisp focus. And uh, the background behind the mushroom is still mostly in focus. Uh, so general, in general, it's a good trade-off, but not always. And it's really nice to have a camera with an aperture so you can decide and you can take a bunch of pictures with different apertures and choose which one you like best later. Another thing that you can set is the ISO, and that is setting the camera's sensitivity. So if you turn the ISO way up, the camera is very sensitive to light and you can get away with a very fast shutter speed. However, the photo will be grainy. And so if you look, um, if you, if you zoom in all, all the way, especially, there's lots of kind of looks like snow or noise in the photo. And then if you turn the ISO down all the way, then the photo is not grainy at all, even if you zoom in, zoom in a whole lot. But you have to keep the shutter open for a long time to gather the light. So the camera, if your ISO is low, the camera is very sure about each pixel. Whereas if the ISO is high, the camera just guesses about a lot of the pixels. And so that sets the, sets the light sensitivity. And a lot of times um, you do want higher ISO because if you're holding the camera handheld, if you turn the ISO way down, then you, the shutter speed is gonna be so long that it's just gonna be super blurry every time. And camera shake is always way worse than uh, ISO noise. Uh, but whenever I'm taking mushroom pictures, I pretty much always use a tripod. And since I am using a tripod, then I can afford to turn the ISO down all the way because the shutter is going to be open for a while anyway. And I can let the camera gather as much light as it wants and be very sure about each pixel. And then with a fancy camera, you can use all these, uh, you can choose all these different sorts of lenses. Uh, so one of the main things about lenses is the millimeter rating, and that's just how wide of an angle it is. So like a fisheye lens would be like 12 millimeters, uh, 24 is like a standard wide angle lens. And then a hundred millimeter lens is really zoomed in. And then it's like a 600 millimeter lens is what a bird photographer uses. And that's even more zoomed in. So people who photograph mushrooms usually use somewhere between 30 and 100 millimeters. And the only lens that I carry is a 50 millimeter macro lens. So it's kind of somewhere in between. It's, it's a pretty good medium. Um, but I do have a wide angle macro lens, which is really cool uh, if I want to get a close up of a mushroom, but also have all the background, the whole forest in the frame at the same time. Um, and I used to carry nothing but a hundred millimeter macro lens, but that's a very small slice of the whole scene. And so you really just kind of only get the mushroom and not much of the background. So I think somewhere in the middle is, is a good medium. And a macro lens, uh, all that means is that the lens can focus very close. And when the lens can focus close, then it'll take awesome pictures of tiny things. So I pretty much only use macro lenses because I love focusing close and a macro lens can always focus far as well. Um, but one of the most important techniques to make your photos look awesome is focus stacking. Um, if you've ever seen the work of Stephen Axford or pretty much every photo I've taken in the past few couple of years, they're all focus stacked. And uh, what that does is you're combining a whole bunch of different photos into one picture. And it kind of bends, um, bends the rules of photography to allow you to get as much depth of field as you want, and then a very blurry background. So your subject uh, stands out really well from the background. And you can take as, you can stack as many photos as you like, so you can have as much depth of field as you want. So uh, focus stacking involves taking a, a whole bunch of different pictures and each picture is focused in a slightly different place. So first I'll take a picture that's focused even too close. Um, and that way just that ensures by starting on purpose too close that I'm not accidentally starting into my subject and losing some, some of that. Um, so I focus the camera too close, and then a lot of uh, the high-end expensive cameras have a feature called focus shift shooting on Nikon or focus bracketing on Canon. Uh, Olympus has it as well. I don't think Sony does. Um, 
what it does is it takes a very large number of pictures, as many as you tell it to, and it changes the focus just a little bit for each picture. And it does this very quickly. So usually um, it takes me about 10 seconds to actually take the pictures for a focus stacked photo. And when I do this, I open the aperture all the way. And that makes it so the background is very blurry. Um, and also when you close the aperture to get more depth of field, it makes everything a little bit more blurry. So having the aperture wide open uh, means that you get really, really good detail. So uh, on my camera, this is what the focus shift shooting looks like. Um, you can see that you can set the number of photos and how much it changes the focus each time it takes a picture. And if you have like a flash, it has to recharge or something, you can have a delay between pictures. And then I take all those pictures and I load them into Adobe Bridge. And so that's just a photo viewer. And I can flip through all the pictures really fast. And that's where I decide what the first photo I want to use in my stock is and what the last photo I want to use. So a lot of times I like it when the foreground is also in focus. So I'll start my stack really early, um, you know, before the foreground even comes into focus. Because if you just have your subject in focus, it looks kind of artificial because the foreground's super blurry and the background super blurry, and it just looks like something's wrong with the picture. So I include the foreground as part of the stack, uh, but then I flip through all the pictures. And then as soon as the, I find the photo that is the furthest back in the stack where my sub subject is in focus, that's where I stop stacking. And that makes the background maximally blurry. So here is my start photo. And then here's my end photo. And I, you see my end photo is just where it start, where it's just uh, starting to go out of focus in the very back of the gills there. And then I take, uh, I select from start to end in, uh, in bridge and highlight them all and then drag those down into Helicon Focus 7. And over in Helicon, then you get uh, a few different options. You have this uh, method, so you can decide which algorithm it uses to put them all together. But what all of the algorithms basically do is they look at all of the different photos you've taken and figure out which spots in the photos have the highest contrast, and then include that spot in your final image. So the spot with the highest contrast is always the part where the, uh, the picture is in focus the most. So it combines them all into one where you have uh, a whole lot of, um, where you have everything in focus. And um, as you can see here in, in the back, you know, the mushroom is perfectly clear, but as soon as, you know, whatever's behind the mushroom is really blurry and that makes the mushroom stand out from the background. And uh, one thing that this algorithm does not do well is figuring out which frame to include in the background. So you can make any focus stacked photo look better by retouching. And so what I do is just take one of the photos from the stack and then paint over the background with any of those photos. If I want it to be a blurrier background, I paint over with the first photo. If I want it to be a less blurry background, then I paint over it with the last photo. But Daniel Winkler taught me to do this uh, when I was in Seattle uh, a couple months ago. And uh, my focus stacked images turn out way better. At least the background looks way more natural. Because uh, if you don't do this, then it's going to be trying to like pick and choose which photo to use in the background and it's not going to do a good job. So you really just want one consistent frame in the background. Uh, but you can see the foreground, you know, doesn't really need that sort of uh, help. It's just the background. You have to do that too. And it looks really awesome. Um, you get a spectacular detail. What mushroom is that? You gotta tell this is a Luco agaricus. Um, I put this on iNaturalist as a Lepiota. And then Elsa Valinga, who's the world expert on Lepiota, came along and changed the name to Luco Agaricus. Oh. So I saved it. I'm going to study it. Uh, but you know, for now, I have so many mushrooms I need to study that I'm just kind of slowly going through them. And so I'm just going to call it Luco Agaricus for now. Wow. Um, so Helicon gives you a TIFF file, which is this kind of lossless compression format, but it's a huge file. And what you need to do then is convert it into a JPEG. And so when I saw this out in the field, it had really good colors. But now that I've uh, taken the picture and stacked it all together, the colors are kind of muted. They're, they don't, does not look as, as good as it looked in the field. 
So I load the TIFF into Photoshop and I adjust to the expo all the, these different settings until the mushroom looks as good in my screen as it looked in the field. And so um, often I'll hit automatic and it kind of tries to figure out uh, which, what is best and then drag some of the sliders around. Usually the highlights need to go down so the white uh, parts of the mushroom don't get blown out and get nice good detail on your whites. Uh, but really it's best just to drag all those things around until it looks uh, as good as it can. And then another thing you can do to all your photos, uh, which, which can make any photo look better is vignetting. And that just makes the edges a little bit darker. So it makes the subject stand out more uh, and, and the eye does not get drawn to the edge, especially bright things in, in the edge of the photo. So a lot of vignetting looks fake and artificial, but just a little bit of vignetting so you can barely notice it will make any picture better. And here's uh, a picture of how I was uh, taking that photo that you just saw. Um, you can see I put the, the light right up next to it. So it's not going for a natural look, but I have one light on one side, one light on the other side. And uh, well, well, it didn't make it look natural. It did make it look really cool. So this uh, focus shift shooting feature, it, it's really only available in high-end Nikon, Canon, or uh, Olympus cameras. And so if you haven't spent you know, three or $4,000 on a camera in the past couple of years, you probably don't have that feature, but there's ways around it. You can still take cool focus stacked um, photos, even with a very old, very inexpensive uh, DSLR camera. And uh, the way you do that is with a focusing rail. And there's two kinds of focusing rails, but the idea with a focusing rail is that instead of having the camera automatically take a whole bunch of pictures at different depths of field, you move the camera a very precise amount each time you take a picture. And that way you can get your stack without having to have this fancy feature in the camera. And so the least expensive is probably about $60, uh, something like this, a manual focusing rail. And it just fits onto your tripod and gives you a knob. And when you turn the knob, it moves the camera back and forth very precisely. So you turn the knob a little bit, press the shutter, turn the knob a little bit more, press the shutter, pretty much need one of those remote shutter release switches. And some people have really good results doing this. And uh, occasionally people even do hundreds of photos manually moving it each time. However, it's better to use, um, if you're gonna do something like that, it's better to use an automatic focusing rail. And uh, the more, the smaller your subject is, the more important it, it, it becomes to use an automatic focusing rail. And so there's this one that comes from China, it's about $300 called Wii Macro, and that one's pretty good, but you have to carry a battery in the field then. Um, and then if you're using some rail like this, then you can use this really awesome extreme macro lens, which is only $400 and will get you spectacular photos of slime molds and things like that. It's the Laowa 25 millimeter lens. But there's also a microscope objective that costs $17 that does almost exactly the same thing. Um, and so I don't have the $400 one, uh, but I do have the $17 option and I'm really happy with it. I've been able to get spectacular macro photos and, you know, four times, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it is actually a lot. And so unless the cap is extremely tiny, like a very, very small Mycena, you can't get the whole thing in focus, but like to get like a really close in like photo of the gills or, um, or a slime mold, uh, something like this is a really good option. And then if you wanna get a really spectacular slime mold photo like Alison Pollock does, then you use a 10 times or 20 times microscope objective and you just hook the microscope objective directly to the camera. And the more magnification you use, the more difficult it is to take the photo. You might have to stack four to 500 pictures into one, uh, but it's really worth it when you get the results. And I usually like to, um, I mean, I usually out in the forest at night because it's really cool out there, but um, you, act, you can actually get pretty good pictures of mushrooms at night. And so what I like to do is move uh, the light in an arc over the lens after I set up the tripod and I'll do like usually about a three second exposure. And then a lot of times I'll just use my cell phone flashlight and wave my cell phone around and like sometimes I wave it like six seconds on the left and one second on the right. And that makes it look like the light was streaming in from the left. It can look really cool or just an even arc. 
uh, so the light comes from all directions and, um, and it can actually look really good. And then another really fun thing to do is ultraviolet photography and say so you carry a black light and uh, you take pictures of the mushrooms with the black light. And it doesn't have to be super dark. Um, I usually start doing ultraviolet photography at about 3 p.m. if I'm in a ravine or 4 p.m. if I'm not in a deep canyon. Um, but um, you know, so many mushrooms have really cool colors that come out with the ultraviolet light. And so it's very similar to night photography where you wanna keep the light in motion while the camera is still and the shutter is open. Do all mushrooms work in the black light or just certain mushrooms that you're after with the ultraviolet light? All mushrooms fluoresce a little bit, but some of them are much more spectacular than others. Uh, so like a Rusula or a Cortinarius from uh, section Leprosity, or uh, you know, some of these other ones are just like Hypholoma fasciculare are just really, really bright in the black light. Um, whereas a few of them, they're just like a little bit blue, um, but fluorescent mushrooms uh, turn ultraviolet light into visible light. The other kind of glowing mushroom is a bioluminescent mushroom and those make their own light. So they're a whole lot dimmer. You know, black lights can be really bright, but um, you know, these, these glowing mushrooms they actually vary a lot in how bright they are, but most of the ones we have here in Washington are pretty dim. So it needs to be super dark. And so um, you have to wait until what's called astronomical dusk, which is like a, about 90 minutes after sunset until the sun is actually far enough around the world where it's not giving you any light at all. At all. And if you're near a city, you need to wait for a cloudy night because uh, no, wait for a clear night because the light will just bounce from the city, will bounce off the clouds. So um, if you're not near a city, then it can be either clear or cloudy. But you can't have any moon because uh, otherwise you're just taking pictures of the mushrooms in the moonlight, which is cool, but it's not what you want when you have a mushroom that's actually glowing in the dark and you want to capture that. So uh, I make sure I go out after the moon has set or before the moon has rises or has risen or during a new moon. And then I just walk around the forest at night. Uh, usually I'll walk at that spot during the day so I know where the cliffs are and what points of the trail I can easily fall into the water. Um, and um, then I really like to wear glasses because sticks like to poke your eyes out when you're walking at night with no light at all. But yeah, just walking around without any light and you'll see glowing things in the forest and it's a lot more common than you, you'd expect sometimes. There's actually quite a few different species of mushrooms in Washington that glow, uh, glow in the dark, mostly Mycena, Pinellas, and Umphalotus. Uh, no, not Umphalotus. Mycena, Pinellas, and Armillaria. So once I find something that glows, I set the ISO to the very highest I can which will give me a terrible photo because it's so grainy, but it does make the camera incredibly sensitive to light. And so I'll take that first picture as a test photo with the highest ISO and the aperture open all the way. And then I'll look at that test picture and see if I had enough depth of field. If not, I close the aperture a little bit. And depending on how bright that first picture is, I'll decide how long I wanna take the next picture. The next picture will usually be between three and 10 minutes. And so I'll start out doing 30 seconds at ISO 200,000. And that picture, that'll just tell me how much light's coming in, but it's going to be terrible. And then I'll turn the ISO down to something more reasonable, like 800 or 1600, and have the shutter open for something like three to seven minutes. And that will be the good picture that I actually use, actually use for something. Um, so for ultraviolet photography, the, all lights are not created the equal. There's a huge difference in the amount of lights. Um, I've, I own just about every ultraviolet light there is, and I'm pretty convinced that this is the best light you can buy. You can see it's really expensive, $95, but it's, it's one of the few things that you can buy that really is worth every penny. Um, so this is a 365 nanometer ultraviolet flashlight, which is the good wavelength. And um, there's this other convoy that's for sale that's like 40% dimmer and has a dark spot in the middle. This convoy is called a uh, Firefly. And convoy is just like kind of a generic flashlight that people modify to put the ultraviolet LEDs in there. 
Um, but if you Google for uh, C8 Firefly, that's the really good one that has the best LED that they make. <clears throat> and also a really good reflector so you don't get a dark spot in the middle of your beam. So now I'm just gonna show you a few of the pictures that I've taken in the past few months um, and talk about how I took them. And this is one that I took at Mount Rainier uh, a couple months ago. And, <clears throat> and this one is, uh, no, not Mount Rainier, it was Mendocino Forest. But in any case, uh, it was getting dark. So it was almost completely night when I took this picture. So I just set a couple lights on the ground and used image stacking. And I had a bunch of friends with me and we were kind of in a hurry. So I didn't notice that the side of the mushroom was cut off and I was really sad about that, but I still liked the picture. You wanna tell us what mushrooms they are for the new folks that might be interested in what we got here? Yeah, so this one is uh, doesn't have a name yet, but it's super common. And so the name that we call it is Craterellus tubiformis. And so uh, common name is Yellowfoot. Nice. And then here's like a Cantharellus formosus. <clears throat> so you see there was a couple of chanterelles in the background. They gathered a few more and set them down. And then this one is a uh, Fistulina hepatica, which is a beefsteak mushroom. And you might see this mushroom and wonder why I took it because it's not really a spectacular photo, but this is just to document uh, what the mushroom looked like in the field. And the uh, actual good pictures I brought back to the lab and took them there. And so these mushrooms look really cool when you cut them open. And so, um, yeah, really, really cool texture. Those grow here in Washington? Uh, we could check, what we should check is the iNaturalist distribution map for Fistulina hepatica. Um, in California, they're pretty rare and they only grow on chinkapin and wax myrtle. Wow, I don't think we have those growing here. <laughs> yeah, it's possible you don't. Do you have chinkapin and wax myrtle? Yeah, not that I know of, I never. Yeah, I've only seen them in Northern California and Mexico. Uh, here's a porcini. It's kind of hard to photograph porcinis, but uh, laid, laid a bunch of them out. And then here's a matsutake. So you can see, uh, you know, matsutakes are pretty hard to photograph because they're usually just kind of like little mounds of dirt. So picking them is really difficult because uh, Picking them for a photograph is really difficult because it's really easy to get sand on the stem and gills when you pick them. Um, but I took a couple, uh, a couple buttons and laid them down in front and a couple large ones and laid them down in front um, and then focus stacked it and ended up getting a reasonable photo out of it. Why is it hard uh, to also, photograph Porcini? What's that? Why is it hard to photograph Porcini? Um, I think they just, I don't know, my, my porcini photos are usually terrible, but I have a couple of good ones. They're just, uh, I think it's hard to get the right angle on them or something. Yeah. Um, this is another example of one where I needed to turn that down the exposure compensation to not blow out the texture on that stem there, because the background is black, so the camera meters the light for kind of the, back, the black background there. And if you don't change it and just use default settings, then you lose all of your detail in the brightest parts of the photo. So I pretty much shoot all my photos at like negative one exposure compensation or, or even more if it's a white mushroom in the black background. And you can always raise the exposure compensation later in Photoshop, but you can never lower it because once that detail is gone, the, the data is just gone. Uh, this one I sequenced built a phylogenetic tree so I can figure out what a species it is exactly. And so once I've done all the work of taking a really good photo, my next question is, well, what is this thing? And so everything I photograph, I collect, and then I'll bring it back into the lab and sequence the DNA. And then I can build a tree like this. And what this shows me is where else in the world, the exact thing that I photographed occurs. And it helps me figure out which name I should be applying and what it is that I've taken a picture of. Here's a little tiny Mycena. This one's called Mycena stylobates. And the cool thing about this uh, Mycena is that it glows in the dark. So this is um, a picture. What I did is I, just, I, I knew the mushroom was gonna glow in the dark. 
but it was bright out when I took it. So instead of waiting uh, for like six hours for the sun to go down, I just put it in my tackle box and brought it home, threw it on a piece of black velvet in my bedroom. And so this is the picture I took with light. And this is the same picture taken without light. So you can see that those Douglas fir needles are actually making their own light and glowing. And you can also see that the mushrooms themselves are not glowing at all. And whenever I do something like this, I always take the exact same picture with white light and without white light. So this picture, I had the shutter open for about three seconds and I moved my cell phone flashlight in an arc over the lens. And then for this picture, I had the shutter open for like three minutes and uh, had the, my bedroom in complete blackness. And since I had a tripod set up, the photo, the camera was in the exact same position. So you can flip back and forth and you can see which parts of the mushrooms are glowing. Occasionally the whole mushroom glows, sometimes just the cap, sometimes just the mycelium as is the case here. Oh, that's the mycelium on the needles. That's me. Yeah, so the needles are glowing because the, they're colonized by the mycelium. Gotcha. Interesting. And then this is a mushroom that doesn't have a name yet. So we borrow the European name Mycena phyllopes. And it looks cool because I found it right about sunset. And um, so very little of the light is natural light and almost all of it came from my lights. And then I did the same thing with ultraviolet. So I can flip back and forth between the ultraviolet photo and the white light photo. And that allows you to see what parts of the mushroom are most fluorescent. Uh, this one's really unique because it smells like mothballs. It has a very unique odor. And the stem base always has these cool pointy rhizomorphs. Hmm. Here's Dendrocalibia racemosa. And this is an example of a very small mushroom that looks really cool because it has all those pegs where it makes spores in the gills and it also makes spores on the pegs. But this mushroom is much smaller than it really looks. Like a very large one would be a centimeter in diameter cap. And so you pretty much always need photo stacking uh, to get a good picture of these. So this is like 45 pictures uh, combined into one. Here's uh, the first picture I ever took of uh, Dendrocalibia racemosa. This one it was before I started doing photo stacking. Turned out okay. And then this one's definitely stacked. So I started, you know, focus stack all the way close. And there's about 60 pictures here combined into one. Where do those grow? That's amazing. Uh, this picture here I took in Washington in the Psilocybe azurescens habitat, wow. um, like over in Grays County. But uh, specifically, they grow on old Rusula and Latarius. Mm. So when there's, uh, you know, uh, this was under the shore pine. There were some old rusulas that were growing there, and they just grow on the shore pine, uh, or on you know on the old moldy rusula and lactarius. Usually, the mushroom is long gone, like it's growing on a mushroom that was there six months or a year ago. But occasionally, you'll see them growing right out of the mushroom. Wow. Um, these are not rare mushrooms, but they're very hard to find because they're so small. And so if you pick every little mycena that you see, you'll find quite a few of these, but if you just don't pick the mycenas and just kind of keep walking by them, you'll ne never see them. Hmm. Uh, and this one is Romeria eriraspora, uh, really cool and delicious uh, Romeria. This one's about 40 photos stacked. And to take this picture, I just set the uh, camera directly on the ground. And so, you know, that's, it's usually a good idea just to put the camera directly on the ground. Often I'll have like a bean bag or a bag of rice or something. So the camera is just not like slipping and sliding around on all the sticks. Um, but set the camera down right on the ground, had, had it take about 60 pictures and used about 40 of them. And then you know, this one, it's about 20% nat uh, artificial light and 80% natural light. And th that worked pretty well. This one, maybe Mycena calhounia. The reason I thought it looked cool is because it br glows bright blue in ultraviolet light. So again, take the same picture with white light and ultraviolet light, and then you can see uh, how it looks both ways. Wow. Here is Nolania bicoloropes. And uh, this one is kind of a boring Nolania, except I think the stem texture is really unique, but unless you've seen lots of Nolanias 
you won't find that very exciting. But what is exciting is how it looks in ultraviolet light, which is that same shade of blue that you see in those uh, entolomas from New Zealand. Um, so most uh, nolanias or entolomas do not turn this uh, cool shade of blue in ultraviolet. This one's really spectacular and you can see it from like 50 yards away with an ultraviolet light because it is so bright. Yeah, like cobwebs or something in the gills it looked like. That's oh yeah, this was an old mushroom. There are absolutely cobwebs in the gills. Oh, okay. So the cobwebs caught the spores. So you don't need to do a spore print to see the spore color. You can just look at the color of the cobwebs. Pink spore, huh? Yeah, cool. And then here's a hemimycena, and hemimycenas are awesome because they're so tiny that nobody ever really looks at them or photographs them. Um, this one was growing on cypress stuff, and this is the kind of picture that would just be impossible to take without focus stacking. Here's another hemimycena, uh, also focus stacked. And here's a cortinarius from subgenus leprosobi. And this one's really cool because it glows super bright in ultraviolet light. And by super bright, I mean like as bright as a sulfur tuft. So you can see it from a hundred meters away. It's sort of like a scorpion in the desert where you can see it off in the distance with the black light. Cool. And here's a real close fo uh, focus stack close up that I did also with ultraviolet light kind of hard to focus stack ultraviolet things because you have to have a constant light source. You can't just wave the light around and get it to come from all directions. But this was a small enough uh, thing that I was able to make it work. Well, this one, I only had found one of these mushrooms. Um, this is Entoloma, um, maybe sub something or other. I forget what I'm calling it. Usually people call it Leptonia carnea. Oh yeah, now it's Entoloma subcarneum, if you like that better. In any case, there was only one of them. And so it's such a beautiful mushroom. I know I had to do whatever I could with only one mushroom. And so my friend found this, I sent her back out and I said, don't come back until you find another mushroom. But she, there, there just weren't any more mushrooms out there. Um, so I did whatever I could with this mushroom. And so what I did is I uh, put the lights off to the side and did focus stacking. And it actually turned out to be a, a really good picture. So I ended up only needing one mushroom. Um, but uh, yeah, really cool texture uh, on this one. And uh, also looks really cool in ultraviolet light because uh, the has these little droplets that are fluorescent. So can't really see the droplets very much uh, in white light, but in, uh, in ultraviolet, they, they look really cool. And I wouldn't have even known that in, uh, except that I ran into Damon Teague way out in the forest and I showed him my tackle box and he ran his black light over my tackle box and our, our attention was immediately drawn to this one. Those aren't spores? What color are the spores on that mushroom? Yeah. Uh, no, the spores are pink on this and the uh -huh. spores are not fluorescent at all. They're just like a dull pink and ultraviolet. So no, they're not spores. They're like little droplets that were on the mushroom. Wow. Looks Here's a lot a like a areas. What's that? Looks a lot like the Cordinarius uh, violation. Yeah, yeah, it does definitely have that aspect. Oh, here's zoomed in even more. Cool. Here's another stacked one. I was pretty sure that was this was a Crepidotus uh, out in the field. So I'm like, oh, awesome, Crepidotus, because nobody cares about Crepidotus. So I tried to take the best picture I could of this Crepidotus. So stacked about 50 pictures. And then I'm like, well, as long as I'm going to waste, you know, an hour photographing a Crepidotus, I might as well sequence the DNA. I did that too. And it turns out it's not even close to Crepidotus. It's actually a new species of Pleurocybella. So it had no matches in GenBank. It's super rare. This one was found at Mount Shasta. Um, probably doesn't get much bigger than this. Uh, but once I got the DNA sequence back, I was really happy that I spent all that time taking the picture because now I have a really nice picture of something that is super rare and probably no one's ever paid any attention to before. How big is that? Uh, this one here, the big one was about a centimeter across. Oh, wow. And then here's a photo I took in someone's kitchen in Amboy, Washington. This was Chimenophyllum candissimum. And uh, so they had some kind of like red uh, mood lighting going in the background. Um, but 
you know, they were all kind of like hurrying along on the trail. I didn't want to make everyone wait for me. So I just threw the mushroom in my tackle box and took it in the kitchen instead. Ended up working pretty well. And then here's uh, Psilocybe cyanescens. And uh, this picture I actually took without a black piece of felt and without any sort of, uh, any sort of focus stacking or uh, tripod or anything. Uh, so what I did is I took a Pringles can and I contorted it into a funny shape. So the Pringles can would funnel all the light from the flash right down to the front of my macro lens. And then I just grabbed the mushroom, um, which was found by Sydney Ober Singleton, who's one of the coolest, most, uh, smartest mycologists in the world. He just, uh, I'm like, wow, that's an awesome cluster. Can I see that? And so he handed me this cluster he found and I um, changed the ISO to be all the way low and then uh, turn, close the aperture down. And so this picture I took in broad daylight, but you can't see the background at all because the flash is so bright. And I turned the sensitivity down so much on the camera that it doesn't even matter that it was broad, broad daylight. If it wasn't for the flash, it would have just been a black frame. So I just grab the mushroom, hold it up in front of uh, the camera with nothing behind it. And uh, you get really cool pictures uh, in just one or two seconds with the black background. Uh, then I cloned it to auger. Here's what it looks like growing on a petri dish. And here's uh, Psilocybe ovoidio cystidiata. Uh, so this one, uh, I took this picture in Issaquah, Washington. And uh, you can see it's got the ring on the stem. This was uh, back before I was very good at focus stocking. And so I didn't know that I should open my aperture all the way. So I stacked the F8 because I've read that you get the best, uh, the best resolution, the best detail out of your lens at F8. And that's true, but actually like f2.8 or all the way open, I can't even tell the difference. And uh, it doesn't really degrade until you get down to like f13, f16, f22. Um, so I don't stock at f8 anymore, but uh, that's why the background isn't as blurry as it could be if I had opened the aperture all the way. I threw it on agar, it looks pretty cool. Um, and then the last, two, those last two things, the cyanescence and uh, and ovodio cystidiata, I tried to mate them. So I made monokaryotic cultures, put them on the same petri dish, and they did not mate because they are not closely related. So this is uh, them being extremely upset with each other and absolutely not mating. <laughs> That's it's Psilocybe polliculosa. I think uh, this picture I took uh, in like Port Orchard or something. Oh, I was out with Aaron Hilliard. Oh yeah. Yep. Stacked photo of the gills. And then here's the first good picture that exists of Psilocybe liniformans. So that's when I took in Amsterdam a couple months ago. Uh, again, it's stacked and I put a bunch of extra light on there so you can see up into the gills and see the spore color really well. If I didn't use the extra light, the gills would just kind of look black and you couldn't see that it was purple spored. Uh, Psilocybe hubshiginii. Uh, always very striking looking. And then there's this poster of Mexico uh, that my friend made. Most of, most of the pictures are all the Psilocybe uh, taken in Mexico. Wow. And you can also do image stocking with the microscope. So this is a bluing tuberia. And this one, uh, what I do with the microscope is I set the camera uh, on top on the third eye, the trinocular port. And then I turn on the high speed shooting and I focus the microscope. So it's just above the very top of the thing I want in focus. And then I press down the shutter and it takes a lot of pictures very fast. And as I'm doing that, I slowly turn the fine focus. And so it takes 30 or 40 pictures. Um, and then I load all those into Helicon. And so, you know, the more you magnify, the less depth of field you get. And so it becomes even more important to focus stack with the microscope because your depth of field when you magnify a thousand times is only two or three micrometers. And that's not enough to get all these, to get the whole, even one of these cells, uh, get the whole thing in focus. Here's a favalachia that I found in Washington. Uh, Alva found this one. And then Jack Johnson let me borrow it for a photo. Uh, this one is really tiny. It's only about two, mil two, two millimeters across. And it's the first favalachia ever recorded in Washington. Uh, and this was on a, a coastal dune grass. 
And here's one of these rusulas um, that stains red when you touch it. We call it rusula dissimulans, but it's not a new species. But yeah, it looks like it's covered in blood because it turns so red when you touch it. Uh, but it's really fluorescent. So this is with natural light and that was with ultraviolet. And a macro of the gills. So just focusing the, uh, the macro lens all the way close and then moving the mushroom until it's in focus will give you the best uh, resolution you can probably get, you can possibly get for little tiny things. So that's how I did this one. That's amazing. There's a tuberia parasite. Kind of cool looking. Definitely focus stack. And here's a sterium, um, also definitely focus stack. You can tell just because of how blurry the background is. Let's pop. Also, plants look really good with ultraviolet light occasionally. Um, this viola turned bright blue in ultraviolet, which is really unusual for plants. Um, but again, I like to take the same picture with ultraviolet and regular light so you can kind of put some context in the ultraviolet photo. Here's a salvia divinorum, which is a hallucinogenic mint from Oaxaca. And this one, uh, to get pictures like this, I pick the plant, uh, put it in water immediately, bring it inside, and then set up some lights. Um, for these, I have most of the light coming like behind, from behind the, the, the thing, and uh, just a little bit coming from the front, and then focus stacked it with the black velvet in the background. And uh, that really helps. You know, plants are really hard to focus stack because they're always blowing in the wind. And if the mushroom or the plant is moving at all, you can't focus stack it. So bringing it inside allows you to do all these advanced techniques and get really cool pictures. And the Brumansia, uh, same thing, focus stacked indoors. And this one, I focus stacked like a hundred of them. So you can, hundred pictures, so you can see all the way down to the end of the flower. The uh, Hidnellum pecii, this one's kind of cool because you can see the forest and all of the reflections of the droplets. And if you look really close, you can even see the photographer uh, in the droplets. Yeah, there I am. Here's Tulistoma from Amsterdam. Definitely focus stacked. And a Pluteus. Uh, this is kind of cool because you can see a little bit of the spore print on the stem, pink spores. And then here's a Gallerina marginata, so this is deadly poisonous. And this one's not focus stacked. This is just uh, turned, it, turned the aperture all the way closed to F32. So this is the most depth of field you can possibly get out of this camera. You can see that nothing is very sharp. Like the, the whole thing's in focus, but the whole thing is a little bit blurry. And that's what happens when you use F32. Sometimes it's worth it, but it's a trade-off. There's Phyllotopsis nidulans. I'm definitely focus stacked with some black velvet behind it. And some more black velvet, the new species of lactarius. Here's the spores on, the, on that. So lactarius spores look really cool. Here's a teleschistes on some black velvet with some artificial light. So cool looking lichen. And then here's uh, another really cool lichen. This one's like Tucker Monopsis. Um, and they look really neat, like a sea anemone or something in the ultraviolet light. And some Mycena. These are photographed in the Netherlands. And some Calocera. And then uh, this one is like super fluorescent sulfur tuft. One of the most common fluorescent mushrooms and one of the brightest. And Tulipocladium, if you find one of these, you got to dig it up really carefully because there's a truffle on, under there. Uh, they're Olophomyces truffles, so they're super yucky and don't smell good at all. Uh, but it's cool to find. And then if you cut it open, you can see the inside of the truffle. It's like black like that. And this one, again, I took it on black velvet. Here's Amanita muscaria, that's how it starts out. And then that's how it gets about two days later. And zoomed in all the way on the cap, looks kind of cool. 
and after another day. And so I took these and threw them on agar, and it turns out Amanita muscaria does grow just fine on agar. Uh, here it is uh, magnified a hundred times. So for this one, I just put the petri dish down on the microscope and I put it down upside down. And I used gel and gum instead of agar to make, so it'd be very clear media and potato, dextro, uh, potato dextrose instead of malt extract. So it'd be really clear. And then just used the 10X objective and I was able to get really nice picture of the mycelium on agar. And if I wanted, I could even do a time-lapse of it growing across the agar. That would have been really cool. That's what happens if you eat the Amanita muscaria. The Chalciparis. This is an example of a not very photogenic mushroom, kind of boring, but I still wanted a really good picture of it. So I'm like, oh man, what can I do to make this a good picture? And so I focused the manual focus lens all the way close and did a focus stacked image of the pores and ended up getting something kind of cool out of that beat up dried out mushroom. Here's uh, like, uh, what do they call this? Aloe claveria out in the Washington coast. Pretty cool thing. Daniel Winkler says they're edible. <laughs> and Lepiota decorata is really unique for the color. Postia pitchogaster, uh, also very unique. This one is from Quinault. Or it rained all day. I usually don't pull out my camera when it's raining, but this was cool enough to make it worth worth it. That's Quinault. And there's uh, Shaggy Mane. There's the picture that I was taking in the, uh, in the, in the photo that you posted earlier with uh, where I'm using just a little bit of light from the cell phone to light the undersides. So that's Cunermyces, uh, what do they call it? Cunermyces mutabilis with that scaly stem. That's not a honey mushroom or malaria? No, it's not a honey mushroom. This one has uh, brown spores and a viscid cap. And uh, yeah, so this has a dark brown spore print. If you look really close at those rings, you can just start, like look at that bottom one. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but look at the ring on there. See, it's starting to gather brown spores. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also honey mushrooms don't really have that scaly texture. Right. This one's from Mount Rainier. Mycena strobilinoidea. So, got one just like this of the three and then threw a few down in front. I think the one with just the three looks better. And it also looks really cool under the microscope. This is magnified a hundred times and then this is magnified a thousand times. So um, those edges of the gills are bright orange and this is what makes the edges of the gills bright orange. It's these spiky chylocystidia. Uh, they call it diverticulate. Oh, so that one. Here's an usnia. Uh, this picture is really boring and there's nothing exciting about it. It's just me walking around the woods at Washington at three in the morning, uh, taking pictures of lichens. But with ultraviolet, all of a sudden that looks really cool. And uh, that's because it had squamatic acid, which is a fluorescent acid that's in some species of usnia. And it was just dripping off it. So uh, sometimes it is a good idea to take pictures in the rain. Here's Xyleria hypoxylon, looks kind of boring until you pull out the black light and then it's purple. And uh, here is uh, Oroscalpium vulgari. So these are really cool because they make their spores on teeth. And this one's especially cool because it's growing out of an old, uh, old Oroscalpium vulgari. Uh, so this one, I started the stack all the way close and I combined about 120 pictures. So the closer you start the stack and the further you go, the more pictures you had to combine, have to combine to get the get everything in focus. So sometimes it's kind of a lot. It's worth it though, you get really good resolution on this. Here's Mycena hematopus. Um, so this one, I took, uh, I took out a razor blade and cut the, the cap so it started to bleed. Really good stem texture on this. And Soretio mix of reticulosa is really tiny, slime mold. And here's the veil on Gumphidius. <laughs> this one, I had no idea what it was until I sequenced the DNA. It's Crepidotus aplanatus. 
that cool looking thing. And this is the, the gill edge on that. And then the spores look kind of like soccer balls. Some rhizina. They have these rhizomorphs, they only grow in burned areas. The death cap. Well, here is some Amanita Augusta. And so um, I kind of like this one because it's stacked, but I started the stack really soon and then I included the, the mountains in the back in the stack. So everything all in focus at once. Here's Buckwalda bolinus, which is uh, one of the few bolides that you can cultivate. And here's Porcini. And I put some lights around it so I lit it from below. This is a stacked photo of uh, Amanita pantherina. And you can see on the left what happens when something moves when you're doing the stacking. And so there was a little bit of wind and the wind wasn't able to blow the mushrooms around, but it definitely blew the flower around. You can fix that in retouching if you want. Here's uh, Cortalis basiliscus with Amanita bassii. And this is Cordyceps militaris that Ryan Paul Gates grew. I stacked about 40 images to get this one. Here it is with, ultra, uh, with regular white light. You can see I totally messed up this picture by not turning down the exposure compensation. So it blew out the highlights and there's just no detail at all in the white parts. Uh, but fortunately the ultraviolet one, I didn't make the same mistake on. This one was really hard to stack because the wind, uh, it was blowing in the wind, but I did it anyway. And it has really cool spores, so it's kind of worth it. And here's Pseudobolitis parasiticus, which looks pretty cool in white light and awesome in ultraviolet. Is that a truffle it's growing on? <laughs> That's a scleroderma. So it's, uh, it's, it's poisonous. It's, uh, they call it an earth ball is the common name. And, uh, and yeah, this bully that only parasitizes scleroderma. So they are, they're always growing out of these earth balls. But that was the last slide I had for you guys. So if you have any questions, I can answer them. Um, I'm just going to jump in and say, oh my God, this is amazing. And I wrote down, <laughs> I wrote down Taylor Lockwood, whom we've had as a speaker a couple times. And left me with the impression that you had to go like to Indonesia to get pictures like this. But here you are tromping around, you know, the Olympic Peninsula and coming back with these really, really striking images, which apparently are there for the taking if you just know what you're looking at. Um, do you, is there anybody else tromping around out there with you? Or are you like the only one who has really figured out that you can do that here. There's a few people that are starting to get into it. It's starting to get more and more popular. And, you know, one thing is that like the smaller the mushroom is, the more striking it, it can look. Um, so image stocking is really important, but there's people like Warren Cardamoma, Allison Polak, and uh, a few other people that, uh, you know, Danny Winkler so, um, sometimes, a few other people that like to go around and just like, you know, they'll, they'll look for the rarest things or the coolest looking things and then just try to take the best picture they possibly can of them. Mm -hmm. um, you just get a really striking image of something that's super rare. And it's, it's a really fun thing to do. And so um, I think it'll get more popular as, as people start to get more interested in biodiversity. Well, I'm also thinking, though, that these are probably, you know, if there's a big patch of bullets or chanterelles on the right, these things are growing on the twig to the left. I mean, it sounds like they're right all in the same areas. Absolutely, for sure. That's very cool. Um, I would like folks, to know, yeah, go ahead. Alan, uh, can you show this uh, one slide again where you uh, showed the one cool ultraviolet light, which was 90 bucks or something? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Let's see if I can just uh, put through there. Not that I would attempt to make lots of photos. I'm much more into eating, but the idea of going in the woods at night with an ultraviolet light, that actually appeals to me very much because 
that would be, you know, just fun to look at the stuff without making the photo. Yeah. Oh my, it's, it's so much fun. Um, yeah. It just, you know, makes the, the woods a whole new experience when you're yeah. looking at fluorescent stuff. And like a lot of flowers are really beautiful. Yeah, so this actually blows my mind. Yeah, I never thought about this. You can just do that, go in the woods with an ultraviolet light. <laughs> Yeah, so and this one's kind of like a narrow beam, so you can uh, you can see stuff from pretty far away if it's glowing. Exactly, and that's you know, I mean, okay, it's expensive, but well, I might have another birthday. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so and the other question, what I have you you mentioned uh, that you do, um, you know, you just figure out what mushrooms they are um, doing um, the. Um, uh, I can't think of the word now. The, the, the DNA sequencing. The DNA, and like yeah, the sequencing. How fast can you do that? And, and how often um, can one send you a sample? <laughs> Let's see, how fast can I do it? <coughs> well, if I just start, um, it takes me about 24 hours to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, about 15 minutes of work and then three hours of waiting and then another 20 minutes of work and 20 minutes of waiting and then a, a 20 minutes of driving to drop the sample off at the sequencing place. Okay. So I do the PCR and gel electrophoresis and DNA extraction in my lab and then I'll drop it off uh, for Sanger sequencing in a lab that does that, um, does the, just drop off the concentrated DNA. So the whole process, it takes about a day. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, but yeah, you know, I also have like hundreds of mushrooms in my lab that I want to sequence. So usually when somebody sends me a mushroom, I'll, I'll get them results in a few months. Okay. But you know, it's just, it also just depends on what I'm focusing on. Like if it's something I'm really excited about, I'll just like, you know, go to the lab and just do PCR on that one thing and, and get results really quickly. Yeah. Okay. Just to get an idea how much sense does it make if one finds something, you know, which I think it's maybe rare or whatever. Maybe you know it totally, but does it make sense to send such stuff around? Or I guess with the iNaturalist, you can get the answer if people know more about the mushrooms and tell you, yep, that's really a weird thing. Yeah, um, I think the, the DNA sequencing is incredibly cool because um, you know, all the, the scientists, when they're building their phylogenetic trees, they'll see your, your samples in there. And so it's kind of creating a permanent record uh, when you upload your sequences to GenBank. Mm -hmm. And especially if you take the time to get a really good photo, you might as well get the DNA too. So that way you know what to call your photo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Folks, I was just gonna say, folks who wanna speak up, I think if you hold down your space bar, you can temporarily unmute or just unmute. Oh, I have a quick question. Um, I noticed uh, when you were going through, I think it was the blue mushroom, I took a screenshot of it. This uh, lichen-like thing with the orange fruiting bodies, you, you put, it was up on your screen, but you didn't mention it. Do you, do you see what I, do you see it? Oh, it let's see. The lichen like thing with the orange fruiting bodies yeah it popped up on your screen right after the blue the big blue it's, it's a flat green lichen oh yeah this one the peltigera yeah what do you, can you tell me what that is i found a bunch of that and it was so beautiful and i had i had a hard time finding what it was yeah so it is a lichen and it's a really interesting lichen because when you pick it and you flip it over, there's these rhizomorphs underneath it. So there's like kind of all these white cords that come down off of it. Mm -hmm. So it's really distinctive. And there's a whole lot more species than we actually have names. So usually when you're finding it, you're discovering a new species. Hmm. And oh, wow. um, they're pretty mysterious to me because I don't uh, study lichens, but even to people who study lichens, they're still pretty mysterious. Yeah. Um, but, I found yeah, them in Long Beach. <laughs> Yes, I actually took this picture at Long Beach. So yeah. maybe this is this right by where you found it. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I, I saw them out there too. I brought some back to see if, they, were, if they worked for dying, if they don't. They're beautiful. Yeah, I don't like, think it's the kind of thing that would die. They don't have a lot of internal pigment. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, they're especially beautiful when they're, it's a, you know, a 
a significant patch of him growing over in an area. Yeah, and it's always these super lush areas too. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so I was kind of curious. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What is, uh, like, I'm a photographer too, and I like taking pictures just for the sake of taking pictures, but kind of what's your end game? Are, are you mm -hmm. contribute to like field guides or, or mm -hmm. mushroom books or considering making one in the future? Or do you sell your pictures at art shows or anything? Or? Um, <clears throat> I just like taking nice pictures and I usually... I like to kind of do donate them to the world. So often what I'll do is upload it. Like if I have a really good picture, I'll upload it to Wikipedia. And that way anybody can use my picture forever for free. They can even sell it. They don't have to give me the money. And um, in that way I'm like making a contribution to humanity and I can get, you know, really nice pictures uh, distributed. And like a lot of times when people are, you know, when a newspaper reporter needs a photo for their article, They'll go to Wikipedia because they know that's like a good royalty free article uh, photo they can use for their article. So a lot of times, like I'll see my photos on television or, in, you know, in the newspaper because uh, they'll get oh, something fun. off of Wikipedia. Um, but um, yeah, I think there's a lot of different end games. But the main end game for me is to try to get people interested in nature, so to inspire people to explore nature more. So getting the best picture I can uh, of each, uh, each kind of organism that's out there and then posting it on social media is a really good way to inspire people to go outside and just let them remind them how beautiful the things that you find outside are and how beautiful the little tiny things are, especially if you look really close, the kind of things that people would normally just walk by can be just, you know, absolutely spectacular. And um, I think if we can get more people to go outside more often, that'll be good for the environment because people will be more, uh, more inclined to save it. And, uh, and then to realize what kind of things we're losing uh, when you log a forest, you know, you know, all these things go away. Right on, thanks. Alan, I, I was wondering about one detail of your photographs, because I, I photograph too, and I come back home and invariably I say, oh man, look at all those muddy fur needles that are like stuck to the back of the mushroom. How much time do you spend cleaning up before you start taking pictures? It really depends. Uh, occasionally the mushrooms are already clean and there's nothing you have to do, um, but that's a little bit rare. <clears throat> So um, I carry a tweezers mm -hmm. um, in, my, in my backpack. And uh, some, if there's a lot of fur needles, I'll use the tweezers to, to remove the fur needles. And if there's too many, I'll just skip it and won't even photograph it and just uh, photograph something that's already clean. <laughs> uh, okay. But yeah, tweezers helps a lot with removing fur needles and blades of grass. And it also really helps with arranging tiny mushrooms because like, mm -hmm. You got a bunch of mycenas and you want to get a good picture of them you got to line them all up but without a tweezers your fingers are so fat that you'll lose mess up all the other ones so um, just being able to lay them in there precisely with just like uh, you know, cheap tweezers from walgreens is really helpful but like with those matsutakis that had dirt all over the base do you try do you try to rub off dirt and stuff like that it's definitely <clears throat> it's a lot um a lot quicker to clean them in the field than it is to clean them later with photoshop Mm -hmm. um, but you can definitely clean them either way. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's definitely be better to clean them in the field. I think with that shot, I spent probably about three or four minutes um, you know, getting, getting them set up and you know, cleaning kind of the stuff off of them. And usually I take a couple pictures and then notice like, you know, sometimes some of the needles and dirt looks just fine and others it really kind of ruins the shot. So taking a picture and then looking at it in the viewfinder and then you can decide you know, what needs to be cleaned and what doesn't is a pretty good idea. Great, good idea. Good idea. Other questions from folks? So what kind of camera do you use? Do you, like I'm a, I'm a Canon guy. Do you have a preference or? I don't really have a preference. I shot with Canon for many years and then I switched to Nikon just so I could help my friends, uh, teaching my friends how to use their Nikon camera. And so I have a Nikon Z7 
uh, right now, and I like it quite a bit, but cannons are almost in, in precisely the same. There's not, not much difference. I think the one that is kind of different is Olympus, and those are super good too, but um, I think they do maybe a little bit better with the focus stacking in Olympus, because you can tell it where to start and where to stop the stack. Whereas with Nikon, you just tell it like, I'll take 80 of them and just hope that 80 is enough. Hmm. Nice. Well, I don't know if anybody's got any more questions. I really appreciate it, Alan, for coming on and uh, talking to us this month. Terrific. Yeah, if you think of more questions later, later, you're welcome to email me or message me on Facebook. I'm always happy to answer photography questions. Yeah, can you put your email in the chat for anybody who wants to yeah. get a hold of you or send you a mushroom or something like that? Awesome. Cool. So, I don't know, David? Yeah, Alan, thank you very much. Again, my eyes are just open to the possibilities of what's around us, um, you know, in our own woods. And the number of photographs you showed here of brand new species or unknown species or unnamed species of things that are, you know, I've no, no doubt stomped on is uh, pretty important to know. So. Yeah, there's so much stuff out there. I mean, every little patch of woods probably has at least a thousand species in it. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, probably 2000 if you start looking for the real small things and flipping over logs. So um, yeah, it's really fun to get into this stuff. There's, the closer you look, the more you find and the more complicated it gets. Thanks for bringing that insight to us. Appreciate it a lot.